so glad you can join us as Arnie and I continue to welcome amazing guests for this, the Maccabi USA Sports Show. So it's great to see you. It's a big week, right, Arnie? I'm going to come back to you because I know you want to talk about something in, in, that's of, of, of importance. Um, I guess for me, each week we remain healthy, protect our loved ones. Um, I call it a big week. Today, however, is a very special day. Do you guys know why? Okay, if you should know, look, I'm wearing it. It's voting day. It's the qualifier for the big one in November. And I went over to the polling place today. It was really quiet here in Jacksonville Beach. As a matter of fact, when I walked in, I was the only one there. And I felt so grateful to the volunteers. They were so nice and they welcomed me and they were all masked up. I had mine on as well and um, I was proud. And the reason I was proud is because today is the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. You know, a vote is voice. <laughs> and the history of the struggle to earn the voice at the polls is a fascinating one. And if anyone has any spare time, I actually would encourage you to read it. Um, it's, it's, it is so interesting. And if there's anyone here from Tennessee, anyone here from Tennessee today? Well, if you were, we'd say thank you because it was the 37th state to ratify. It ratified by one vote. That one vote was a 24 year old young male representative who reputedly changed his vote after receiving a note from his mother. Now, if that's all it takes, be a good boy, son. I have a lot to learn, but that's, how, that's truly how it happened. Vote is voice, and we all vote in so many ways, right? We vote how we spend our time, we, and thank you for spending your time with us tonight. We vote with our money, we vote with our actions. And today, what's interesting is how athletes in the world are using their voices in very proactive ways. On behalf of social justice, certainly is what we're seeing very readily now. Um, and it's interesting how fan bases are reacting to that, but they are voting. And today we have an incredible athlete, a tennis champion who was the youngest number one tennis player hailing from South Africa. I love her beautiful accent. She's an incredible businesswoman as well. And I can tell you, I've sat across the table from her. She is formidable, astute, focused, admirable. And from 2001 to 2018, she was the CEO and commissioner of World Team Tennis. She's actively involved in the Women's Sports Foundation and was the past chair. She's a member of both the National and International Jewish Sports Hall of Fames. She's competed in the Maccabi and I know we're all gonna enjoy her stories uh, about that. She's currently the president of Billie Jean King Enterprises and co-founder of Billie Jean King Leadership Initiative, which I think is an incredibly beautiful and really impactful initiative. And Alana, I know you share something about that as well. She's a part owner of the LA Dodgers, all of us eat our hearts out, and the LA Sparks. And she also serves on the executive board of the Elton John AIDS Foundation. I am so, I am so delighted she's with us today. Uh, she's a woman with a voice for sure. She has used it to create ch change on and off the court. It is truly a joy to say welcome to Alana Kloss. Hi, Alana. Hey Donna, hi everyone. It's uh, it's a pleasure and, and an honor to to be here with all of you uh, tonight and to see so many um, familiar faces. Um, and you know, Donna, I think one of the proudest moments for me was actually being inducted into the USA um, Jewish Hall of Fame alongside you and and some others and. Um, you know, I just want to say you've been a great inspiration to me and I think as a woman. Um, you have to see it to be it. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of us are indebted to uh, your passion and your leadership and, and also all the doors that you've opened for, um, for other women and people to follow. So, you know, to everybody here, um, you know, thanks. And again, I'm, I'm honored and I'm, you know, proud to be Jewish. Woo! Okay, so Arnie, I'm going to bring it to you, but before I do, one quick story. We were inducted together, and by the way, those words mean more to me than I can tell you. Totally unexpected, so thank you. Um, so we get there, Alana's going to get inducted, and Billie Jean's with her. My mother was so uninterested in my own induction. Honestly, she did not want to talk to me. She didn't even hang around me. All she wanted to do was be around Alana and Billie Jean King. So there you go. That's how I remember my induction was my mother's rejection of me, totally, um, for some much more impressive people. Anyway, Arnie, why don't you kick us off with some good questions? All right. Thank you, Donna. It's wonderful to be with you again for another great uh, Maccabi sports show. And uh, I am so honored to be with you and Alana. I mean, two world-class 
athletes, but even more important, the impact that you've made out, outside the, the lines and in making society a better place. So we're looking forward to a really great evening. And before we start, you know, Donna, as we talked about a little bit earlier, it was wonderful to hear your commentary on, on, the, on the vote, how important that is in today's time. And I think the other thing, we, we just wanted to make our audience aware of this week, I'm sure you are, but there really was a, a huge uh, announcement made with the Israel uh, UAA uh, deal that was reached midweek. And, and there's a sports connection to that, as I hope many of you know, that it was really a breakthrough a few years ago uh, with um, the sport of judo and, uh, and Israel's participation in the UAE when they won the competition. We saw Hatikva played. And just like we saw it many decades ago with ping pong and the Nixon era, where sports played a major role in, in, in breaking down some barriers, I think we saw that happen uh, with Israel and the UAE. And let's all hope that this is just the beginning of uh, other countries joining in peace and partnership with Israel and leading to what we ultimately hope will be a, a solution, a two-state solution to a long-standing conflict. All right, the editorial's out of the way, politics out of the way. Um, Alana, again, it's wonderful to have you. There's so many things we want to talk to you about tonight because your, your background is so vast and your accomplishments are so incredible. But let's start back as a youth, uh, back in uh, South Africa, and just kind of talk about um, you know, your interest in sports and tennis in particular, uh, and your family's involvement. Uh, I think many of us share that. I, I, I came up and played tennis and I made it through the junior varsity level of college, not quite your level, but my kids all made it uh, to different levels of tennis. And so tell us a little bit about your, your, your life as a youth and how you got interested in the sport of tennis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Ani. I, you know, I think I was um, very fortunate. I grew up in a um, very loving Jewish family. Um, and in South Africa, um, tennis was a very popular sport, especially amongst the, uh, the whites. And um, my parents played tennis a lot. Uh, and, you know, every Sunday we would go to the tennis club and I would go hang out with them from three or four years old. And I just remember kind of hitting against the wall and, and falling in love with the sport. Um, but it is interesting. I, I have to give a shout out to my sister Merle, who I think is is watching, um, because she sacrificed a lot. You know, when a family, when one kid in the family does something, the whole family goes along. And um, but but it was incredible. And I was, you know, I think timing is everything. And um, you know, as a kid, when I was ten years old, all the best tennis players used to come to South Africa to Johannesburg and play in the South African Open. So I was a ball kid and I got to see the very best players in the world. I had um, parents that, you know, always, you know, ensured that both my sister and I could do anything. It was never really about um, whether we're a boy or a girl, they supported us. Um, and so, you know, I just, again, I, I was very blessed and, um, South Africa, the weather's great. You can play outdoors all year round. So that was helpful. Uh, and, you know, um, my parents' parents came from Lithuania. Um, so, uh, you know, I've done my 23 and Me, and I'm going to head back to Lithuania, hopefully sometime when COVID allows us to travel. But um, again, I, I was, I had a great childhood and, um, you know, I was very fortunate. You don't ever do anything alone. And um, I was given incredible opportunities. And I also um, was mentored and got so much help from coaches. And then, of course, from all the players that came from the rest of the world to South Africa in, in the 60s. You were, Alana, you were, you were, you met Billy Jean, I think I read, you were a ball girl at the uh, yeah. tournament at Johannesburg, right? And everybody wanted to be uh, a ball girl, ball boy, and, and, and you yeah. made it there. Is that how you first met? Yeah, I mean, again, my mom, you know, my parents, my mom sold programs, so she worked at the tournament in Ellis Park, at Ellis Park as a volunteer. Um, I would, anytime we weren't picking up balls, I would be hitting on the courts. And um, one Sunday I was hitting with my dad and 
Billie Jean walked by the court and came onto the court and she said to, uh, to my dad, oh, I recognize your daughter. Do you, you know, I, she's been being ball girling for me. Do you mind if I hit a few tennis balls with her? And, you know, um, <laughs> she came onto the court, she hit with me for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and she said to both my parents, you know, your, your daughter has a lot of potential. You should make sure um, she pursues it. And if there's any way that I can help, you know, let me know. And, um, you know, that day I decided at 10 years old, I was going to be a professional tennis player. I had no idea what it meant. There wasn't a professional tour. Um, but, you know, it just goes to show you how um, you have to see it to be it and how important, um, you know, uh, seeing live sports and connecting with, with people is. So again, that, that moment changed my life. And um, I know for everybody, there's usually someone in your life that gives you that opportunity or inspiration. And, uh, you know, for me, it, it was, uh, it was Billie Jean and then, you know, all the other players and, you know, from my coaches, from Sheila Summers to Russell Seymour to Simi Siegel. I mean, to all these incredible people who I think really gave so much so that I could have my dream. So let me ask you, um, Simi Siegel was your coach? <laughs> so we know that uh, the Jews were in, if they were in South Africa, they were, they were in Joburg at that time, right? But were there a lot of young girl, Jewish girls playing sports at the time? Uh, no, not too many, I have to say. Um, but, you know, again, that my parents were amazing. Like, whatever, because they liked tennis and because I wanted to play. I mean, I even played on the boys' cricket team, you know, at Orange Grove School. And I remember my mom, you know, going to the principal and fighting for me to be able to play because they didn't want to let me play because I was a girl. And, I mean, that was just you know, an amazing, as I look back now on my career and my life, and I, I'm so incredibly grateful for my parents. Uh, you know, it's too bad they aren't with, with us anymore. But, um, you know, they, they did everything in their power to ensure that their kids had a better life than they did. And even if it meant, you know, allowing me to go overseas and leave South Africa and leave them back in South Africa, and my sister followed me. So, um, there were not that many young uh, Jews playing tennis, period. You know, you, you had to, if you were a girl, you know, find a good husband um, who was a doctor or a lawyer. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, they allowed us to follow our dreams. And, um, you know, I'm incredibly grateful for them. Uh, but again, you know, the sport was just starting and timing is everything. And by the time I was 16 or 17, there actually was a, uh, a professional tour. And ironically, September 23rd of this year is the 50th anniversary of the birth of women's professional tennis. The original. Bravo. And yeah. So, you know, it's those people whose shoulders um, uh, we stand on. Right. I'll just tell you quickly, I don't know, of all the tennis fans, I was at the Open last year, and Diego Schwartzman played. And of course, I'm going crazy, and I'm with Lou Scher, and he's a friend of Alana and mine, who actually uh, is in charge of all revenue for the U.S. Open. I'm going, Lou, Lou, this guy's Jewish, this guy. And so, like, I just couldn't get up. And, like, he's the only one. Like, there aren't many Jewish tennis players in the elite ranks. You are among the very few. Yeah, they have, you know, Schlemmer, Glickstein, uh, Brad Gilbert, um, I, I think uh, Shahar Pear, um, I'm trying to think of a couple who played in, in my era. Um, Stacy, I think you're on, right? <laughs> yeah, it's so great to see you. Yeah, um, so, you know, there, there were not many of us, uh, Rainy Fox, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think the one thing about sports and, you know, I think, I mean, Arnie, you, you talked about, um, you know, what's going on at, with the UAE. And it's, uh, sports really brings people together. And I think it's the one um, area where it doesn't matter what race, what religion, um, you know, it, it does help unify. And there've been some amazing sports stories. So I think, um, you know, even as a kid, I remember, you know, I, um, because I was from South Africa, we actually 
um, in the 70s were kicked out. We weren't allowed to play in some places because of apartheid. So in Fed, Federation Cup, which is kind of the Women's World Cup of tennis, South Africa was kicked out, which was, you know, it was just hard to even, even grasp that. But, um, and I was playing doubles even with Martina Navratilova and uh, Czechoslovakia wouldn't let her play with me because I was a South African. But I really do think that um, sports for the most part breaks down barriers and there've been some um, amazing stories, um, you know, about, and I think about the Israel tennis centers, you know, and what a huge impact that made on the country. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to go there. Ian Froman did an amazing job with that. So um, I think, you know, again, uh, sports is amazing. It is a microcosm of society and it does mirror what goes on in life, even though people tend to separate it. That is so true. Let me, and Arnie, if I could, I just want to remind everybody here, there's a chat button. This is the kind of webinar you just put up whatever you'd like. Um, uh, like Roy Kessel has family, he's, he's, he's connected to everybody, but Alana, he says his cousins from South Africa, Alana and Gail Joss, but you played with them. Yes, I, I, I did. And uh, they actually lived down the street, a few houses down the street from us, and they had a tennis court and we used to play there. And um, uh, Ina Joss was one of my mom's best friends and Benny Joss, um, I think, recently passed away so um yes thank you and uh, hello to to you I, I can't see you on the screen but but i remember the joss family very well that's right so anyway please forward your questions we're happy to um bring them to alana uh, arnie how about you yeah alana be, you know before we kind of get off this topic of um you know some of the things social justice wise you've seen in your life and the impact of sports uh, for, for some of the younger people may not uh, recognize the name, but some of the older folks do. We just lost a phenomenal tennis player, Angela Buxton, um, a, a Jewish woman who um, really was broke the, with Althea Gibson, who was the first African-American champion. Um, you know, they broke a barrier. And uh, as, as I was, you know, going back and refreshing myself on Angela, I mean, she had a lot of you in her. Uh, I mean, somebody that really cared about social justice, um, somebody that in England, she was, she was, she's British, um, so, you know, really experienced a lot of anti-Semitism herself in terms of where she could go and not go. I'm just, I'm just wondering if, you know, if your paths crossed and uh, you, you were both Hall of Fame uh, 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 inductees as well, but, you know, given that, given her past, I just thought maybe we want to comment on her. Absolutely. I actually, um, Arnie, I was with her um, last uh, September. Uh, she was very responsible for helping Althea Gibson, who actually had very little money and Angela really um, got the word out there and helped raise money. She also championed along with Billie Jean and Katrina Adams, you know, having a statue at the um, Billie Jean King National Tennis Center and um, it was terrific that she was able to actually be there for the unveiling. Um, and again, you know, I think uh, for her, probably as much as for me, it's really what we did off the court that matters the most and that we're, we're most proud of. I think, um, you know, sports gives you this platform and you be, you're able to build incredible relationships, but it's what you do with, with that platform and the relationships that I think is important. And, um, she really, um, I think, uh, you know, did tremendous good for Althea. So I, I'm going to stick on tennis. We'll get into, get into uh, your, your success on the court just briefly. But you, you won an, a couple of incredible major titles as a junior. I think it was 1972 and uh, Wimbledon. And talk a little bit about that. I mean, as a, you know, as a teenager coming up and playing in, the, in Wimbledon itself, I mean, how awesome was it? First of all, who did you beat in the finals? And how awesome was it to win that championship? Uh, it, it was incredible and um, incredible for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, growing up in South Africa and uh, Donna and some of the women on this call will understand this, that um, the, the girls were never sent overseas to play, that only the boys got funding to play. So 
again, my mom and my coach had to fight for me to be even be able to be entered into the junior Wimbledon tournament. So, you know, once that hurdle was crossed and, and I remember, you know, as a 16 year old kid, uh, you know, getting on a plane, actually Sabina Airlines, because they gave me a voucher and I had to fly via Brussels to even get to London. And in those days, we had these, you know, huge suitcases, no wheels on your case. So you'd be schlepping your case through the airport to make the connecting flight. Um, and I, you know, it just, but I couldn't wait to go. And um, it was, uh, it was amazing. Actually, BP, um, also gave me a grant so that I was able to uh, afford the trip and I was part of their squad. But, um, you know, I just, again, playing at Wimbledon was a, a dream come true for every kid. Um, I think you grow up wanting to win Wimbledon, certainly if you're not American. Um, Wimbledon, growing up as a South African kid, Wimbledon was the dream. We used to listen to Wimbledon on the radio because we didn't get television till 1976, if you can believe that. Um, but I, I beat a, a girl by the name of Glynis Coles in the finals. Um, she was British and um, I mean, I hate to admit it, but the only reason I won is she was more nervous than I was. That somehow I managed to get a few extra balls um, over the net. But it, it was incredible because, um, you know, as a young kid, I, I had that dream. Um, actually, ironically, that year, Billie Jean King won the um, Wimbledon uh, women's singles. So me winning um, the juniors that year was, um, was pretty special. And um, I, I tended to have a great career as a kid. And then when I was much older, in the middle where there was all the great prize money, I didn't do so good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm curious, as a tennis fan, I've been my whole life, who, who do you enjoy watching, both on the men's side and the women's side? Who just got you all excited? What was it about their, their personality or their games? So I, you know, I tended to love the players who kind of pulled you in and had, uh, you know, personality. So it was the, the Jimmy Connors, the, you know, obviously I loved watching Billie Jean. I like watching people who served and volleyed, you know, and came to the net because that's how we learned. In Johannesburg, it was 6,000 feet altitude. So, um, you know, you, it was hard to keep the ball in. But I mean, there are so many, I think every generation has great champions. And, um, you know, to me, Chris and Martina were my era. Um, so they became good friends and they were exact opposites, right? Chris was very steady from the baseline. Martina took a lot more risks. Um, but I mean, today it's such a different game. The, the players are incredible athletes. I mean, you look at, you know, you started really with uh, the Monica Salises and then the Venus and Serena. And, you know, now you've got, you know, Coco Goff and Naomi Osaka. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, today, I, I, I think there was an article in Forbes magazine that nine out of the top 10 um, money earners uh, in sports are women athletes. And um, it's just, you know, it's incredible. Um, how big the game uh, has gotten. And we were very lucky that tennis so early on had champions like, you know, Billie Jean and the original nine who, you know, fought, uh, fought for equal pay, uh, which was amazing back in, in 1973. Amazing, 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 amazing. Cannot thank them enough for what they did, how they did it. I, I mean, I, 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 wherever I go, I, I talk about this because I just think you, you said it twice. You can't be it if you can't see it. And they, and they allowed us all to see it. Not so much. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I think it's two things. It, um, it, it is about the, um, the message, right, um, that it gives to people that, you know, if, if you're a dad, you want the same opportunities for both your sons and daughters. Uh, and then I think in some ways it is about the money because that's how people measure things. And, um, you know, if you have, if you do well and you make money, you can then do good with that, with that money. So I, I, I think people get upset when women, um, 
you know, want to play for the money or talk about money, but, but money does empower you. And I don't think there's, um, you know, there's anything wrong with that. Totally agree. And just so you know, Scott Kalb, we have all these people now listing all the Jewish tennis players, which is kind of <laughs> Tom, Tom Acker, the Dutchman was Jewish. I did not know that. Harold Solomon, Gladys. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. That's pretty yeah. interesting. Eh? Yeah. No, Harold was oh, great. Sharon he Fishman from Canada. There we go. Yeah. Well, there um, you go. We're growing by leaps and bounds here. It's amazing. <laughs> Arnie. Mm -hmm. Well, those are great names, by the way. Uh, Harold Solomon brings back a lot of uh, a lot of great memories. That that man could hit from the from the uh, baseline and stay in stay in matches for quite a while. Um, I just you know let's stay on tennis just for a second here. Um, talk about talk about the different Grand Slams. I mean, you know, you have different surfaces from grass in Wimbledon to, to clay uh, in, um, in in France. Um, where did, what surface did you grow up with in terms of your training and how difficult was it both as a singles and a double player to kind of go from one surface to another? So, um, you know, actually in the 60s and, and 70s, three out of the four major championships were on grass. So mm -hmm. Australia was on grass, Wimbledon was on grass and um, and the U.S. Open was on grass. It, it's only probably in the last, I'd say, 30 years that they now are on kind of four different surfaces, although Australia's hard court, which is pretty similar to the U.S. Open. The French is clay, and, um, and obviously U.S. Open um, is hard court and Wimbledon grass. So, I mean, they are different. I think, uh, you know, the, the clay surface is a little bit slower, and so you have a little more time. Points tend to be longer. Um, but the circuit, uh, the way it is now, the calendar is kind of built in blocks. So there are a whole bunch of tournaments on the different surfaces that kind of prepare you, you know, for each of the, uh, the four um, majors. So, um, you know, and I think nowadays people don't come to the net as much as they did uh, in the 60s, 70s. Um, we used to serve in volley. That was really the game because the grass courts, the, you never knew how the ball was going to bounce. But now that the bounces are a lot more true, it's a very different game. And I think also technology um, with rackets and strings and, and even the players, they're in much better shape. They do uh, so much more training off the court, the nutrition. So I just think every generation has gotten better. I think that's right. Now, here's a, here's a question, like Scott. Thank you for your research, but here's your question. Um, PhD, here it is. What was your most memorable win, and who was the toughest player you ever played? Wow. Um, so I think my most memorable win um, probably uh, was uh, two, two, two victories. One in doubles, which is winning the U.S. Open um, in, in 1976 uh, with my uh, South African doubles partner, Linky Boshoff. Um, we were not expected to win, and um, so that was pretty exciting. We were going to actually on to the Atlanta tournament the next week, and the whole of the second week from the quarterfinals to semifinals to finals, we kept bringing our luggage to the courts because we thought we were going to lose and have to leave. Um, so that, that was, was pretty amazing. Um, I think in singles, probably the biggest one I had was over Martina, never to love it, down at, uh, at Amelia Island. Um, but, you know, uh, I think, to be honest, like the Maccabea games for me was amazing. Um, you know, the first year I played in 1973, um, I won the mixed doubles with David Schneider and the women's doubles with Hill and Wiener and the singles. So, um, you know, that was incredible. And then I went back in 1977 um, and, you know, got to carry the flag for South Africa. Um, which was probably the, you know, one of the, I think, the greatest highlight of my, um, of my life. Walking into uh, Ramat Gan Stadium, uh, Golda Meir was there. Um, so, you know, I think it's those, it's the victories on the court are nice, but it's really um, what, what those victories allow you to do. Um, and, you know, so uh, 
you know, it just uh, amazing experience. And I have not been back to Israel since. I would love to go. I was hoping to go when I was inducted into the um, International Jewish Hall of Fame, but my mom uh, wasn't well. So, um, but I definitely, um, you know, will will go back because I have incredible memories from, you know, from the 70s. Well, I definitely missed you there for sure. But you know what? We do have a, an official invitation for you to join us in 2022 for the Maccabia. So you okay. can come back, right? I can't yeah. tell you yeah. carry the flag or not. That I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm strong enough. Wait, are, you, are you a US, you're a US citizen now, aren't you? Yes, exactly. I have to yeah, So there you go. Have... But uh, you can play seniors tennis. It would be awesome. Alana, you can be my co chair. <laughs> oh, who's, who's, who's chairing tennis? Stacy. Hey, Stacy. Stacy, are you friends with Howard Levy? Yes, that's how. Yes, I of course. That's how I met you. Okay, great. So Stacy, could you can co-chair with Stacy? There you go. <laughs> and also, I have another um, amazing story actually from the, the Maccabea Games. Um, I got to play in '73. Um, Richard Raskin was playing for the U.S. Oh. team, and um, David Schneider and I beat Richard Raskin. And I believe Janet Haas in the finals of the mixed doubles. And um, four years later, I played Renee Richards in the first round of the US Open. So I, I don't know how many players played Renee and Richard um, the same. You know, I played Renee as a woman and I played uh, Richard as a man, which is pretty amazing. But, but she, Renee is an incredible human being. And, um, you should really have her um, on one of your chats. Uh, she's, no, she's, she has, you know, idea. she's really um, incredible. And she was a, uh, still practices as an ophthalmologist, um, but, but really um, a, a very special human being. That's actually a great idea. There's so much now um, being discussed about yeah. women's sports, the lines on transgenderism. Who, who yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fascinating. And I have heard like amazing things about her. So yeah. I, I love that idea. All right. Um, everybody here is playing Jewish geography on the sideline here. <laughs> and, Russ, and Russell Stoke, always, I, he, he always, David Schneider was in my sister's class at H.A. Jack and lives about 40 minutes from me. Don't you love that? And yeah. Jay Berger, he was ranked seven in 1980. Yeah. And we all, I, I know his son, Daniel, because he's a world written pro golfer. I think he just won a tournament a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, so it's kind of cool. And then um, Andrea said that they would love to have you as, your co as, their, as their coach. So you're getting recruited heavily here. I, I, I didn't tell you about that pressure part. Yeah, it's, yeah, not pressure, it's love. It's family love here. That's how it works. We should talk, listen. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I, well, maybe I can play mixed doubles with my, with my nephew, Josh. Now we're talking. <laughs> Now we're talking. Wait, wait. I'm asking the chair because she's on the. Uh, she's right. Stacy. <laughs> yeah. Can I get wild carded in, or do I have to really qualify? How big a check do I have to run? Oh, big, huge. <laughs> <laughs> I know you, Lana. Huge. <laughs> you just said the magic words, Alana. You can get anything with my copy with a big check. <laughs> big checks. A lot. Like as I said, Alana is an amazing businesswoman, and um, she's involved in so many different enterprises. But you know, w, you know, world team tennis was out of the box thinking when you guys came up with it. Tell us a little bit about the um, origin of world team tennis and how you got it going to, and you also had an exit. You sold it, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, no, listen, I was very um, fortunate actually. World team tennis is the reason that I had an opportunity to come to America and actually start saving some money. Um, it, the first year was 1974 and was started by Billie Jean, Larry King and a bunch of other um, people actually. In the early years, um, Bob Croft owned the Boston Lobsters, uh, who now owns the Patriots, Jerry Buss, who owned, uh, you know, the, the Lakers and the LA Strings. So, um, you know, they were looking for events to put into arenas in the summer. Uh, Don, I know you're familiar with that. Yes, <laughs> um, I do. Um, but, but the whole premise of World Team Tennis was that, you know, I think um, Billie Jean and Larry always believed that tennis could be an individual sport and a team sport. And it's one of the few sports that has both. And, um, you know, they always thought that there should be a team season and being able to play for your city and your country was huge. And I think they took it a next step by 
having men and women equally represented as part of the team. So, you know, both teams had two men and two women. And um, it was really important for, for Billy, especially that when, when people came to see a World Team Tennis match, whether you're a little boy or a little girl, you could see yourself. Um, so, you know, it, it, the league is, I, this year, I believe, uh, 45th season. Um, you know, there are only four other leagues that have lasted that long, and they're all, you know, the big ones. Um, we did sell the league three years ago, which um, we, were, we were really pleased we were able to do it because uh, I think, you know, Billy's a big believer that she wants things to continue beyond her. Um, but, you know, I think we're just proud of the fact that we were, we were able to keep it going for so long and, and, and the message that it sent that, you know, everybody's uh, contribution was valued. Right. But well, it was Lana, you, go ahead, Arnie. Go ahead, Arnie. Oh, no. Well, Lana, you, you did a great job, by the way, as commissioner and uh, before that as an executive director. And for anybody that hasn't gone to a World Team Tennis match, it is so much fun. Um, and, um, you know, some of the rules and from uh, time clocks and other things that were put in place. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so innovative and so much fun. And, and Jan, Alana, are you, I, I assume you're, you're still very active. I, you know, I had the chance to watch the championship uh, yeah. a few weeks ago. It was on CBS and yeah. it was, for those, it was the first sport in the country, I believe, that has opened it up to fans and, um, I mean, it was, it was really something. And the, the, the championship came down to the last point, which was rather amazing. But, you know, talk about that. Uh, have you stayed involved in, uh, in yes. the organization? Yeah, so we, we still own the Philadelphia Freedoms team, uh, which is one of the teams in the league. And um, actually, Billie Jean did go down to the Greenbrier, where the championships were held. And um, they brought all the nine teams to the Greenbrier and had a bubble. And... Um, you know, really amazing. Everybody stayed healthy, uh, which which uh, I think obviously is the most important thing. And um, obviously limited fans, but it's uh, it's amazing. As I sit here in New York, and the preparations for the U.S. Open are beginning, and players <coughs> are starting to arrive, uh, and yet they won't have any fans. Uh, and you know, it's so uh, it's. Uh, it, it, we are very proud of the fact that we were able to keep people healthy and, um, and that the finals were so great. So thank you for saying that on. Uh, Donna, can I, can, I, can I move into just one other area and, and then I'll turn it back over. But, you know, I think all of us with COVID are watching the sports scene every day, professional, how they're coping, but um, also the collegiate area. And, you know, you and Donna as incredible <laughs> leaders, and I know you've been involved with, with the, uh, WSF for a number of years, but I think all of us are, are looking at the football probably not being played in many parts of the country and what that may do for some of the other sports, the non-revenue sports at the collegiate level. And, and obviously many of those are involved, uh, are, are female student athletes. W what are your thoughts about that? And obviously there's legal protections that are now in place, fortunately, but you know, obviously, I think all of us want to see a robust, you know, um, men's and women's program at the collegiate level and uh, the concern that, that uh, football may, may impact these other sports. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a concern because, you know, um, women's sports, women's jobs in general are the first to get cut. So uh, thank God for Title IX, which does provide some protection. Um, and for those of you who don't know what Title IX is, you should look it up. Probably the uh, 37 most important words of legislation um, that were, were, were ever passed in, in 1972. And really what that law said was that any high school or college that was given uh, federal funds had to spend those funds equally on boys and girls. And it actually really wasn't about um, sports. It was about education and sports was tagged on. And in those days, there were quotas for women lawyers and women doctors, usually only about 5%. So Title IX really changed that. And it also really opened up um, the world for women's team sports. You know, Donna was the, I think, second commissioner of the WNBA and 
now there's you know women's professional soccer and 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 lots of other things but but arnie i think you're you're right um a lot of money uh comes from college football um and you know uh that not that many programs make money from college football but the alumni loves college football and supports the school so it's definitely a, it's a huge concern the only thing i'll say about tennis is because it is a a, a co-ed sport and boys and girls um, can play this would be a great opportunity for the colleges actually to um to adapt world team tennis and have one team two genders um, which will keep tennis alive uh, within schools but there's no question that um you know we have to be alert and we're going to have to fight to ensure that um you know women's collegiate sports stay strong and i mean donna you could probably talk to that better than i no i think you've done a beautiful job but you raised an issue that we can all actually become even more aware of together and that is in the maccabi movement um, there's been an awareness about how to not only maintain but grow uh, girls' participation, Jewish girls' participation around the world, and something we're looking at avidly now. And I, and Marshall, I'm looking at Marshall. I can see him here. I'm going to ask Alana if she'll spend a little time just talking to us about it because it's so important. Anybody here, and it's not a woman's issue. It's a it's a world collective human issue and opportunity. And and it's something that we think with a little love and attention, we we can probably bring a lot of goodness. And trying to elevate not only the amount of women who participate because you know you think about parts of the country where women don't have access to sport and how, how important sport is you know for all the things that you've spoken about yeah and i think you know that's where the women's sports foundation um you know it's all about access and and opportunity and i think um the great thing about sports just participating i think 96 percent of women in the c-suite say that they played uh, sports either in high school or college but you know for a woman that's where you kind of learn the rules I mean you know the guys made the rules and if you play sports you kind of learn the rules so I think it's it's important from a health perspective and it's also I think important from an integration into the business world um, you know as well and I just think you know sports um, strong body strong mind and and i think you don't have to be a champion athlete but i think it's really important to be active and i think it's hugely important for dads to encourage their daughters and you know to play with them um be, and moms too uh you know just i think it's the greatest gift you can give anyone in the world just an opportunity to feel good about their body and be active so, and we want to be the supreme gift givers. You know, there's a guy on this call, we always ignore him, his name is Don Kent. But if his wife is watching, um, she is a supreme fan of women's sports and an excellent filmmaker. So I'm hoping that she's paying attention to all the brilliance you are offering tonight because it's really, it's really terrific. Arnie. Elana, well, I just want to say something. You know, you just made an important point. Uh, uh, the, the work, the groundbreaking work that individuals like you and Donna and Billy Jean did. Oh, well, paved the way so that for all of our daughters, when my daughter now plays sports, we don't even think about the fact that there was a time when those opportunities didn't exist. And um, that's an amazing statement to make, and it's an appropriate statement. And uh, again, I think all of us need to pay tribute to some of the pioneers that uh, led us to that path. So thank you for that. Um, sure. I want to just talk to you about you, you. You've ventured into some fun things now outside of tennis, with the Sparks and uh, with the uh, Dodgers. And how did that all come about? And uh, how much fun are you having being an owner of those teams? Yeah, no, it, it's been amazing. It actually came about. Um, Kamal Murray, who's the coach of Sloan Stevens, um, lives in Chicago, and he. Um, had this dream to open this place called Excess Tennis. It's a, it's a tennis uh, uh, academy on the south side of Chicago. And um, Billy, obviously, Billy and I lived in Chicago for a while and we told Kamau we'd help him out. And you know that's why I'm, I'm always a big believer in relationships and, and helping others because it does come back to you. And, um, I, we were at an event and um, I had an opportunity to meet Mark and Kimber Walter, who are the owners of, uh, the majority owners of the Dodgers. They actually live in Chicago, they have a daughter. 
and um, just spend some time with, with Mark, who, um, you know, really fascinating guy. And uh, it was funny. He, he said to Billy Jean and I, you know, geez, it would be really great to have you involved in some of the things we're doing. You know, what about the, um, the LA Sparks? <laughs> Billy, like, he didn't even finish saying Sparks. And she said, well, how about the Dodgers? <laughs> <laughs> and and he said why not and you know the the fact is that sometimes you have to ask right and and um he said absolutely and so i think what's been amazing um for me to see because you know i i had the benefit of billy jean fighting so that i would have the opportunities i have today and and, you know, being by her side and, and seeing her every single day fight to ensure that others have, you know, opportunities um, is amazing. And to actually now be sitting at the table with her, because most of our life, and I think a lot of women, Donna, you, uh, you've been at the table too, but for a long time, you know, we've been outside the door looking in and just hoping that, you know, maybe we'll get in for a minute. And so I think symbolically it's huge to actually be at the table and be part of um, the organization. And, you know, what I'll say is that it, it, having different ideas and different men, women, you know, it doesn't matter what your gender is, uh, what your your religion, your race, I think it's so important to have different voices at the table. It only makes um, any organization stronger. And so for me, um, I'm so I'm excited for myself because it's really cool. And, you know, I get great seats, although even we didn't play baseball in South Africa, but I'm learning. Um, but I'm really excited uh, for Billy and the message that it sends to other women, you know, that that you have to keep pushing and if we've made it easier for other women to follow in our step, footsteps that's great without a doubt without a doubt it's such an important message and it's great that you are part of the ownership team i'm hearing a lot more about a lot of i mean look let's look what happened in uh, nwsl where we had that great sort of celebrity superstar ownership team Je you know, Jessica Shastain, Natalie Portman, Serena, and Serena's husband, I guess, Alex Ohinian, um, to own a women's soccer team, right? Again, another very powerful message. Yeah, well, I think it's really important that um, women and men invest in women's sports. And, you know, I think that as a CEO or as a person who has some control of a budget, um, you know, buy a season ticket to support women's sports. Um, you know, you can make it important. Trust me, if you're in charge, if you lead, others will follow. And so I think to us, it's great to see women investing in women, men investing in women. And, and I think it's, it's, it's better for everybody. So I think that's huge that, that you know, um, women and, uh, entertainers and women who have money are investing in women's sports. I think that's terrific. Yeah, it, it, it is terrific. Where's Arnie? Arnie? I'm, here. I'm here. I'm here. Alana, you, you've called uh, two individuals as your heroes. Uh, obviously, Billie Jean King is another, but you, you called Arthur Ashe and Nelson Mandela as personal yeah. heroes. And talk a little bit about them, what they've meant in your life and obviously in the history of, uh, of South Africa. So, um, you know, I, I'll start with Arthur Ashe because, um, you know, he came to South Africa in 1973 to play in the South African Open. And I think it was the first time a person of color actually was allowed to play in the tournament. And um, it, it was a big deal. And um, Arthur's agent, Donald Dell, um, I used to play mixed doubles with his brother, Dick Dell. And so, um, Donald actually ended up uh, being my agent in signing my World Team Tennis contract. So, um, but, but when Arthur came to South Africa with Donald, the thing that he did, he brought the world with him. And um, because we didn't have television in South Africa, I think the South African government at the time 
was able to get away with a lot more because people in South Africa really didn't know what was going on outside of South Africa and, and vice versa. So when Arthur came, um, I just think it really, for me, it changed my life and I think it changed South Africa for the better for all time. Um, and, you know, he was an amazing uh, individual. I got to know him and his wife. Um, and, you know, also uh, Arthur, as you know, um, well, from died of, of uh, HIV AIDS, and, which was contracted from a blood transfusion. And Billie Jean and I are very active in the Elton John AIDS Foundation. So Arthur was the tennis connection, um, you know, and, and that was a difficult time. And so I just thought that he, um, he was an amazing, uh, you know, humanitarian. And, and then, you know, the other person, um, obviously Nelson Mandela, um, I think growing up in South Africa and um, just, you know, I mean, for someone to be in prison for 27 years, um, you know, the way that he was treated, the way that his wife, Winnie Mandela was treated, um, you know, was, was awful, uh, shameful. And, um, you know, I, when he was freed, um, it just, as a South African, I was born in South Africa. Yes, I'm an American now, but um, I think wherever you're born, your soul is there. Um, you know, we're very, very proud, um, proud of, of the way he dealt with, um, you know, with his freedom, right? And he didn't, uh, he used it, I mean, the whole reconciliation, um, process that South Africa went through because of Nelson Mandela was incredible. And you know, it's one thing to acknowledge something, it's another thing to, to have reconciliation. And, and the past months here in, uh, in America, um, you know, there's been a lot of pain and, and, and suffering. So I think of Nelson Mandela and I think of him, uh, you know, what a great leader he was. Uh, if most of you probably saw the movie Invictus um, and just how brilliant he was to embrace the sport that most South Africans loved, rugby, and, um, and bring the country together. And I think, you know, one of the, um, I think the greatest moments in my life was um, being able to arrange a meeting with Nelson Mandela and Billie Jean King. And um, it, uh, I'd been trying to set up a meeting and meet him because Billie Jean had wanted to meet him her entire life. And I was in South Africa at the time visiting my mom and I got a, a, a phone call from um, Zelda Lagrange who works at Nelson Mandela, who was Nelson Mandela's uh, executive assistant. And she said, you know, Mr. Mandela is going to be in Houghton uh, on Friday, this was Wednesday, and he can see Billie Jean. Billie Jean was in Prescott, Arizona. Um, and I called her, uh, she was visiting her parents. She drove down the hill to Phoenix, flew for 24 hours, and um, at 11 o'clock on Friday, uh, on December morning, um, we met Nelson Mandela, and uh, I literally couldn't breathe. I, I honestly, um, it's like, you know, uh, it's the only time in my life that I, I literally couldn't breathe. So um, just the, um, the gratitude that I felt um, for a man who'd sacrificed his life um, for a better future for everyone um, was pretty amazing. So again, you know, I've been lucky, but it starts with parents who, um, you know, set, the, <clears throat> set your path and teach you what's right and wrong. As a young kid, my parents, um, when I was 12 years old, I was playing in a junior tournament in, in, at Ellis Park in South Africa and the finals fell on Yom Kippur and they made me default and I was so mad at them. I cried my eyes out, but I came to understand that, you know, sometimes you have to do the right thing. And I was always taught that. And um, again, I was lucky to have people like Billie Jean, Arthur and, and Nelson Mandela in my life along with my family because um you know that's the, those are the true heroes really you know the people who help you every single day those are some wonderful stories thank well, you for sharing that with us if that doesn't put it in context i don't know what it it what does 
Andrew Weinberg said, Alana, thank you for your leadership, for your contributions to the world, and for being a game changer in sports and in the corporate world. I want to quote another great person. I think it was you tonight. And you said, sports gives us a platform, but it's what you do with it that matters. And what you have done with it and what you're continuing to do with it truly, truly does matter. And I can tell you, you imbued all of us tonight with pride, right? Mm -hmm. You make us think about the value of our family, the fact that we don't do anything alone, the fact that we compete as Jews, your experience as a South African, then coming to the world, all your stories, the success you've had, the fact you've taken this time with us. We are so grateful. And um, we're booking your flight for 2022, just so you know. All right, I'm there. I'd love all to. All right, there we go. We're good. But I want to thank everybody. Obviously, we all owe a debt of thanks to Alana. Um, so appreciate your candor and your stories. I want to thank our entire MS MUSA team, of course. I saw Marshall and Mackenzie and Dan, our producer, Steve and Shane, of course, and Don Kent and all of our volunteers and officers. Jed, it's good to see you again. who are doing great work showing how sports is such a vital social and life-changing force. Next week, you're gonna love this, Alana. Nancy Lieberman's gonna be joining us. Oh my goodness, she's had so many firsts on the basketball court. She was the youngest player to earn a basketball civil medal in the Olympics and the first woman to be a head coach of a men's professional basketball team and the second assistant female. I think she came right after Becky to coach in the NBA. And yeah, and don't, don't, don't forget she coached Martina Navratilova. She helped get her in incredible shape. So there's- I remember that. I forgot about that. That's right. That is exactly right. I totally forgot. So there you go. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, remember everyone, let's keep up the momentum about voting. It's not until November, but let's make sure everybody votes. We'll be using our voices in a very important way. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a great night. And Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Stay safe.